Awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Christoph is <laughs> skipping that one. Did we get an one. answer? Yeah. How the telegraph is uh, dealing with it? No. <laughs> no, no, he's skipping that one. Uh, smart guy. Well, thanks, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the final session of today's conference. It has been a great run. And for this final session, we are once again very, very proud that we are allowed to welcome an uh, expert here today. He's a true master of his craft and is also the author of the best-selling book, Der Medici Effect, which was just published in the German-speaking world. Who read it? The Medici Effect? It was just Knows published. Yeah, I know, but probably someone. Well, they can oh, okay. read it <laughs> later on because everyone's <laughs> going to get a copy of it. Oh, really? How cool. Awesome. With signature? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, okay. Where is he? Yeah. But since he's the best ambassador of his own message, we will not say anymore. And we are really happy that he is here and spent this, um, yeah, your knowledge on stage with us. So please welcome the CEO and founder of the Medici Group, Mr. Franz Johansen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, almost good evening. Good evening. Okay, I want to see if that works. I know we're in Austria. Uh, <laughs> I'm here to talk about innovation and how we drive it. How do we come up with great ideas, but how do we also think about the execution of those ideas? That's what I'm going to do over the next sort of 25 minutes. I know that I'm what's between you and something called Club X. I don't know what that is, but it sounds freaking cool. So, so before I get into any of that, though, I thought that should take maybe uh, 75 seconds, maybe 90, to tell a bit about myself, where I come from. I'm even interested in this topic. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Good. I'll do that then. The answer to the question where I come from is my parents. So you need to know something about my parents. My mother is black and Cherokee. My dad is Swedish. And they met in Germany, obviously. <laughs> but I was born and raised in Sweden, which is located here. Now, something about Sweden during the time I grew up in this country. Okay? When I was young, Sweden consisted essentially of two groups of people. One group was blonde, blue-eyed, and quite reserved. And the other group was me, basically. <laughs> and I'm joking when I say that. That was me and my sister. Uh, here's my favorite hobby. Here's my favorite movie. I went to college at Brown University. I studied environmental science for the following reasons. When I did that, I saw something fascinating. There were a lot of different scientific researchers at this university, but I never really felt they were able to pull together the purpose of the research, and I wanted them to do that, so I created a science magazine that essentially had that effect. It's celebrating its uh, 23rd anniversary this year, and this inspired me to start a healthcare company based on my aunt's research at Johns Hopkins, which is one of the leading uh, hospitals in the US. She was the first black female tenure professor at Hopkins, and this inspired me to start a software company. Which, oh, I went to business school at HBS at Harvard, started a software company, which did great, until it didn't. And, uh, <clears throat> and then I got an idea for a book. I'd seen that in my life, whenever I was able to combine concepts from the different industries I've been exposed to, or from the different cultures I've been exposed to, I had a better chance of breaking new ground. And so I wondered, is that a general truth for innovation? I researched that, which took me far longer than I ever imagined. I was literally down to almost $2.45, but things turning around. The book came out, and it turned out being a great success. It is now out today, literally. It's the official first day of the German edition. It's the 20th language. Um, and uh, I'm on a tour, actually. I was in uh, Munich and Frankfurt. Now I'm here today. I wrote a book called The Click Moment. I'm going to talk about that as well. Start a company called The Medicine Group. We have clients uh, all over the world, some of them uh, uh, regional here as well. In the middle of this, I got married, moved to Brooklyn. Now I have a daughter. I actually have two. Now I'm here with you. Basically, it's my story up on this particular point in time. So, oh, thank you. Thank you. So, look, there's a lot of entrepreneurs here. I'm often asked by would-be entrepreneurs seeking, seeping, sort of escape from life within huge corporate structures. How do I build a small firm for myself? And according to me, the answer is obvious. All you really need to do is buy a very large one and just wait. <laughs> and over time, 
you'll have a small one. Why is innovation so challenging? Why is innovation so difficult? This is really the question that I want to start with, because what I'm going to explore is that the Meditzer effect is the answer. Why is it challenging? And there's, look, there's a lot of different reasons why. You, you've heard a lot of them through the various panels today, through various conversations today. I'm going to hone in on what I consider the most important challenge, the most critical challenge, and it is this. We tend to rely on expertise and logic in trying to reach success. Now you look at that and go, well, yeah, because what else are we supposed to rely upon? Like uh, incompetence and illogic. But what happens if you use logic to be your guiding light to set yourself apart? What happens if that is your compass? It suggests that you now believe that logic is your competitive advantage. The one thing that sets you apart from your competitors, except your competitors have access to logic. It's not a unique asset that you have. Let's imagine for a moment that you work for a company. I'm gonna pick a car company completely at random, considering my background. Let's say you work for Volvo, okay? And let's say you evaluate a car along five dimensions. Right, reliability, size, safety to sign, and miles per gallon. Unless you have a direct competitor, let's call it Audi. This is an example from Young Wee Moon at Harvard Business School, but it perfectly illustrates the point I'm about to make. Now let's say that you, along three of these dimensions, are more or less the same as Audi, like reliability, size, miles per gallon, but there are big differences between you and the other two. Like you are crushing it when it comes to safety, but not so much when it comes to design. It's out its reverse. If you use this as a guide, it becomes obvious where you should improve. You should just improve design, and then, well, then you'll beat Audi. Except Audi's thinking the same way. So what do they improve? Safety. And now something interesting starts to happen. <laughs> 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 Using logic to set yourself apart means you're going to end up in the same place everybody else is because it's the logical place to be. This is why innovation is challenging. If we could just, if we could just be rational about it, we'd all have trillion-dollar companies. What about expertise? I said expertise is a problem as well. We know expertise is critical for success. This is Serena Williams, one of the most formidable tennis players who's ever lived. She won her first US Open in 1998, and her success is an entire, entirely a function of expertise. She's an example of a rule that got popularized a number of years ago called the 10,000 hour rule. Has anybody here heard of the 10,000 hour? I'm just curious to see if this is like one person. So what's up? So <laughs> basically what the rule says is something like the following. If you want to become the best in the world at something, then you have to practice for 10,000 hours or more at that thing. And the reason that rule works is because 10,000 hours is a lot of hours. No, it's like you're way ahead of everybody else. Serena is a perfect example of this. It suggests that her success is less a matter of talent and more a matter of dedicated, dedicated practice over years and years and years. It's true. She can barely remember having lived a single day of her life without having played tennis. And this rule has been used to describe success more broadly. You need expertise. Except, does it hold up? How much practice do you think Reed Hastings had in video rentals before he started Netflix? I mean, he ran through a couple of movies. He didn't like the whole process, so he starts Netflix. Take Richard Branson. How many hours of practice do you think he had running an airline before he started Virgin? Virgin Airways. He did, look, first he started Virgin Records, right, and then he did the next logical thing, Virgin Airlines. <laughs> but he started it with a lawyer. The guy started Virgin Islands with a lawyer. So what is going on? Why is it that for Serena Williams, 
we can use expertise to predict our success. It perfectly predicts our success. But for the rest of us, it seems to be maybe a part of the puzzle, but certainly not predictive. And the reason why is because for Serena Williams, the rules of the game never changes. These are the measurements of a tennis court, and they stay this way for like 100 years. It used to be, for instance, sometimes the rules change, but those rules are very slight. It used to be, for instance, that if you wanted to serve a ball in tennis, you needed to keep one foot on the ground. And they changed that rule in the 60s, so you could actually jump and serve. Wow. <laughs> How can anybody keep up in this fast-moving world of tennis? <laughs> Look, Serena knows exactly what she needs to do to be successful. She just has to do it better than everybody else. How does it work for the rest of us? So, Nokia used to be the Serena Williams of the mobile phone world. In 2007, they were three times larger than the next competitor. And they knew the rules of the mobile phone, mobile phone world cold. Phones were supposed to have cool colors, cool shapes, and cool ringtones. And all of a sudden, none of it matters. Colors, black. Shapes, rectangular. Ringtones, apps. Of course, today we see even further elaboration of this. If the rules of the game can change, then your ability to predict what you need to do to be successful drops. This is why innovation is so challenging. And you might then say, yeah, maybe. But maybe, maybe Nokia was just idiots. You can say that in retrospect. Maybe they didn't see the writing on the wall. Here's a quote from a Nokia executive. It's a very, it's a very insightful quote. Um, we missed big trends. That's from the former uh, CEO of Nokia. <laughs> but, but was it easy to spot the trends when they were happening? I mean, what did people say about the iPhone when it came out? I mean, today we know it's revolutionary. But let's go back to when it came out, because I think that's more relevant if you want to try to understand how to be successful around innovation. And here's what CNET said, the leading tech site at the time. Apple is slated to come out with a new phone, and it will largely fail. So that was wrong. Here's Bloomberg. Apple is unlikely to make much of an impact on this market. Here's Ed Colligan. He used to be the CEO of Palm. Okay. <laughs> How many of you even know what Palm is? Okay. We've learned and struggled for years here, figuring out how to make a decent phone. PC guys are not just going to figure this out. They're not just going to come walking in. My point is not to make fun of these people. My point is simply this. Those people knew more about mobile phones than anybody else on the planet. So if they couldn't figure out what the next logical move is supposed to be, who is supposed to do it? I mean, who is you supposed to turn to to gain this insight? The truth is that it's the unexpected that makes us stand apart. The unexpected means that you've discovered something that was not available to a logical analysis, that was not a, available to deep expertise. And this is why innovation is so challenging. There were any number of people in Silicon Valley that were slamming their heads against the wall when YouTube came out. Right? You upload a video, and then you watch the video. Like, are you kidding me? That's the whole idea? <laughs> what? What nothing of that? Except, except, even the founders of YouTube didn't think of YouTube. I mean, YouTube started out as a dating site. It's true. The idea was you upload a video of yourself, and then people vote whether or not they want to date you. That's an awful idea, okay? <laughs> um, but then two of the founders went to dinner. They were filming that dinner. They had no way to easily share the movie. So uh, they realized that their platform could actually do that. And so that's what ended up happening. YouTube came out of that. I argue that surprise is the leading indicator of innovation. If something has happened that makes you surprised, it means that you hit upon something that might not have been available to all the other startups and established companies out there, a customer reaction, an insight, something that surprises you. This suggests that something unexpected has happened. 
So then how do we take this fact that innovation is so challenging? How do we take that and use it to our advantage? Because what I'm essentially arguing is that there's a lot of serendipity, a lot of randomness, a lot of unexpectedness that gets into innovation. And so I have five points that I want to make now around that. The first one is simply this. Always look for opportunities to change the rules of the game. Be aware of that you're not playing tennis. We tend to simply accept how rules have been established. What I mean by rules, I mean assumptions about how an industry is supposed to work. We don't even necessarily think about it because we didn't even think about that those things can change. I'll give you an example. So a client of ours over many years, Nike, uh, if you were to simplify the business model, I'm talking about dramatically simplifying it, you could essentially say that first they have to come up with great products and then they have to sell those products. And the way they sell them primarily is by getting sponsor sponsoring like great athletes or teams. And then they hope that these athletes and teams keep on being successful, right? Great model, but it's an expensive model. Uh, how many of you know who this is? Just curious. Raise your hands. Okay. This is LeBron. He's probably the best basketball player on the planet today. Uh, Nike paid him, no joke, Nike paid him $1 billion. $1 billion. Ronaldo got the same. Uh, I saw that we had uh, somebody from Bayern München earlier. So this is another guy, Adidas. I don't know what Adidas paid him, but I know he wasn't cheap. And he's pretty good. <laughs> um, so what happens if you're trying to compete with Nike? I mean, what if you don't have the cash? What if you don't have a billion dollars to pay someone? And most of you in this room probably don't. Making an assumption. <laughs> so Under Armour is another brand in the U.S. that has for many, many years basically tried to compete with Nike and have competed with Nike in many categories, but nowhere near the same access to cash. And now they start asking the question, well, who's an athlete exactly? I mean, who decided that the rules of an athlete is that you have to be a soccer player or a basketball player or a tennis player? What if an athlete can be a ballet dancer? This is Mr. Copeland. Mr. Copeland is probably the be best ballet, female ballet dancer on the planet. She's the first black female ten <laughs> first black ballet dancer for the American Ballet Theater. And they created an entire line based on her. It's the most successful women's line. Uh, I'm going to show you a video of their marketing campaign that started off really the relationship with her. And it was, um, it, when it came out, it really went all over the world. But in this video, you can see the power that this relationship could bring to a brand. Dear candidate, thank you for your application to our Ballet Academy. Unfortunately, you have not been accepted. You lack the right feet. Achilles tendons, turnout, torso length, and bust. You have the wrong body for ballet, and at 13, you are too old to be considered. challenge the rules that exist with whatever industry that you are in? Can you challenge the assumptions? Ask yourself that every day because we live in a world where that has been, it's never been more possible than today. You're not playing tennis. Nobody dictated exactly the rules that you have to play by. But now you might say, fine, I'll buy that. But it's not that easy to change the rules. That's a pretty big ask. Change the rules. 
So we need a way to think about how to do that. This brings me to my second point. Oh, not quite yet, okay. <laughs> I added an example of how this is playing out in the digital space. Uh, for instance, right, Uber. Here's the question when you are, here's the question that basically you were challenged with from your parents throughout my entire childhood and, and traveled, it sort of stuck with you as you got it into an adult. The basic rule is this, never step into a stranger's car. So today, that's all we do. Or like, here's another rule. Never have strangers stay in your house. We don't care about that rule anymore. Yeah, and the more strangers, the better. <laughs> we can challenge, we can challenge our assumptions about how society even, society is supposed to work. And so, now I'm getting to the point of how we set ourselves up to do that. Find inspiration from industries and cultures other than your own. The idea that diversity drives innovation is a fundamental idea around innovation. In fact, I've written a whole book about it. That's what this book is about. Let me give you an example of what I mean. We have this hospital, in, in, this is in Cambridge, in the in UK, and they have this challenge. When they transfer patients from the surgical unit to the intensive care unit, they have two separate teams treating this patient, which means that you have one, a lack of coordination, a lack of collaboration, which leads to errors, which leads to sometimes death. So how should they fix this problem? What is the most obvious way to fix it? It would be to see how have other hospitals fixed it. I mean, what are best practices? But they didn't do that. Instead, they teamed up with McLaren to understand what happens at a pit stop crew in a Formula One car race. Because when they looked at it that way, they realized that there are connections, right? I mean, there are things that you can learn from what happens there, and you can, you can transfer those concepts, you can transfer those, some of those ideas into the hospital, then maybe you can drop the error rate, and that's what they did, decreasing the fatalities. And you're better off looking for these ideas, not from your narrow field of expertise or your industry, but by intersecting them with areas that are as different as possible. I call this effect the Medici effect based on the Medici family who ruled the city of Florence some 500 years ago, not too far away from here. And they, did all, they inspired people uh, and brought people and funded people from lots of different disciplines, architects, sculptors, philosophers, painters, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo. And they brought them to the city of Florence where they, were able to, where they were able to break down the boundaries between the different disciplines, between the different cultures, and ignite what became one of the most creative eras in Europe's history, the Renaissance. How do we create this type of Renaissance in our own lives, in our own companies, in our own teams? How do we create this effect that the Medici family created? And so this is the way to do it. This then suggests that if you can create diverse teams to help you build that's supposed to be test, but, you know, it's mobile. It could be text. And execute ideas. You're better off. Ask yourself, who are you surrounding yourself with? Who's on your virtual board of advisors when you're innovating? Is it, is it the obvious group of people? Is it the logical choice of people? Because if it's the logical choice of people, your competitors are working with the exact same constellation. Increasing the diversity is critical in this regard. So here's a screenshot from a game, or a artwork from a game called Mirror's Edge. Does anybody have played this game? What's up? So, uh, <laughs> uh, and it's actually, it's uh, it, it, Electronic Arts has this game. It comes from a Swedish studio called Dice. And they are huge in first-person shooter, but they ask themselves, how can we innovate first-person shooter? Now here's how video game making, particularly at, this, at that time, used to go. It would be that you had animators over there, programmers over there, designers over there sitting in different parts of the building, and sort of they would sort of communicate to each other via project management software or email or something like that. And they said, I want to change that, the lead designer of this game said. So you asked for a bigger office, 
And then he had an animator sitting next to a programmer, next to a designer, next to an animator, next to a programmer, next to a designer. He said for two weeks, he thought they were going to kill each other. And then something changed. It used to be like this. Uh, hey, uh, can you do this? Hey. No. <laughs> <laughs> and so now I said it was like this. Hey, uh, can you do this? Uh, no, but I can do that. Oh, that's, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that before. <coughs> yeah, we were talking about I like to add. So this game, right, starts to challenge the notion of what you can do with a first-person shooter. It becomes an incredible, uh, it gets all kinds of innovation awards. Not because they had a greater R&D budget, per se, but because they simply changed the constellation of how the people were working. Looking for intersections, looking to create the Medici effect. Are you able to accomplish that? That becomes the question. And you can do so if you have the diversity, but then you also ensure that that diversity becomes inclusive. You break down the silos. You leverage the different perspectives. Now, if you do that, you will become successful in creating more ideas. Now, why is more ideas so important? Because me to this point. More ideas are important because it enhances your shot at innovative success. Basically, in order to be successful, you have to place more bets, and then you have to double down on the winners. You have to shut down the losers. Over the past 50, 60 years of innovation research, people come up with all kinds of different ideas about how to innovate, but there's only one thing that virtually everyone agrees and it is that the people that change the world try far more ideas. They create more ideas and they try to make more ideas happen. This is true for artists, scientists, it's true for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs. The single strongest correlation to innovative success are the number of ideas that you created and try to make happen. Picasso made over 50,000 works of art in his lifetime. 50,000. Einstein published over 240 papers. Why? Why this enormous production? Because they were not sure what was going to work or not. Do you know that Picasso made over 50,000 works of art, but most of those works of art were collecting dust in basements around the world? Why? Because, because they sucked. <laughs> it's true. I mean, we don't like to think of Picasso that way, but it's true. Einstein wrote papers that weren't referenced by anybody. Zero citations. Think about that for a second. One of the most brilliant minds of the past hundred years hung out here quite a bit. He wrote papers that no one found worthwhile to comment on. You think he planned that? This paper will have no impact. This is not the story we're told. This is important to remember. We told the story of a brilliant genius or a brilliant strategy. Okay, so how many of you have played this game? I know you have because you've been to meetings. <laughs> it changed the world of games for the iPhone, for the iPad. That's why I'm mentioning it. And when it came out, people were like, oh, my God, it's amazing. Like the, the, the ease of play, the colors are cool. You got to kill pigs with birds. <laughs> Even the marketing strategy was brilliant, right? They, they focused on making it number one in the Czech Republic first. And then when it was number one, they, they leveraged that fact to make it number one in the UK. And then they went to the US and said, hey, we're number one. Brilliant. Well, if they were that brilliant, why did they, this is Rovio, the Finnish studio at Rovio, why did they wait eight years to do it? Angry Birds was their 50-second game. You haven't heard of the other 51. It's true. If you tried something 52 times, your shot at breakthrough success will skyrocket. Almost all innovation sort of graphs look something like this, right? Lots of ideas. This is for healthcare. Lots of ideas over here, and it goes, you, you lose them, you lose them, you lose them, and then one makes it. 
That, that was for a, that's for a pharma company. It looks the same way if you say look at business plan competitions or whatever. And you can be fooled into assuming that the idea that made it all the way over there, the way it worked was smooth. Look at that. It starts here and it just moves along. But in reality, what is really happening through that one idea is being tossed and turned around. This is a statistical description. These are statistical descriptions of an innovation process. But they do not describe the innovation journey of any one specific idea. I don't have time to get into what that is right now. But let me then get to the last reason, last point here, which is that what I just described is the key reason why diversity and inclusion are such huge driver of innovation. Much of the work that we've done at the Medici Group is bringing together the idea of diversity and inclusion with innovation and strategy. We operate really at the intersection of these two fields. We consider it the most fundamental and powerful intersection in the world today. Well, innovation you're all sold on, whether it's AI or blockchain or whatnot, but diversity, you can also see it. It's all over the world. People are talking about it. People talked about it here today at this conference. And when companies figure out how to leverage it, they can change. They can change themselves. They can change the world. One of our clients is uh, Disney. Like, so, it, was it an accident that Disney was the movie that came out? The first studio that came out was a Black Panther? It wasn't. They have ESPN. Using diversity, creating much more diverse teams. They're able to look at their global markets in a completely different way. All right? Nike, another company we also worked with for many years, by being able to think about the possibilities, not just between different functions, but between different cultures, they're able to take some, an idea like the Burkini and do something with it to create a global product and brand as well. Spotify, digital. We worked with them in April to put together an event that completely changed how events happen because we leveraged the diversity of everybody in the room. Can you take ideas, can you take perspectives and bring them together in a way that can create an entirely new concept? The truth is that the world is connected. That was really my big point that I wanted to share this afternoon. The world is connected, and you've sort of seen examples of this, right? Hospitals connect to Formula One. The world is connected. But it wasn't just created that way. Somebody made the connections. I think it should be you. Thank you very much.